soul of Germany. Its romance, its culture, its sense of history. Even its food and drink define the image of the nation. And much of it is down to the legacy of one man. Ludwig II of Bavaria is a legendary figure. The handsome boy king, loved by his people, betrayed by his ministers, and found dead in mysterious circumstances. A monarch obsessed by beauty and heroic legend. who sacrificed everything for his art. Even today, his castles and palaces are the most fantastical examples of romantic architecture anywhere in the world. Nowhere have history, illusion, artifice, and reality combined to create such visually powerful buildings. And all of them are windows into the soul of their extraordinary creator, Ludwig II, the Dream King. Our story begins here, in the mountains of southern Bavaria. Hohenschwangau Castle sits high above Lake Alpsee. It was here that the young Prince Ludwig grew up. An enchanted landscape providing the perfect backdrop for a flourish of Gothic fantasy. For Ludwig, a shy child with a vivid imagination, the castle represented a wonderful refuge, escape from the conventions and bustle of court life in uh, Munich. It and this wonderful landscape captivated his imagination, ignited an obsession for the past and in many ways to find his life and the fate of his kingdom. Ludwig's father, Maximilian, had built the castle in the 1830s on the site of a medieval ruin. He spent much of the year here with his Prussian-born wife, Marie, and his two young sons, Ludwig and Otto. Ludwig was a dreamy child. He loved stories and art, dressing up and make-believe. For most children, this is an obsession that begins and ends at the dressing up box. But for Ludwig, it was his whole world. Ludwig's father decorated the walls of the castle with scenes of ancient chivalry and combat. It was a very particular vision of German legend. Maximilian called this his Hall of Heroes. These are the scenes that Ludwig grew up with, highly romanticized images of medieval life, knights, castles, chivalry, every room in this castle fed his imagination. You can see here the scenes of his later obsessions. But 
reminded though they are, the paintings at Hohenstangel carried an important political message. In the mid 19th century, there was no single German nation, just a group of princely states and dukedoms. Two of the largest were Prussia and Bavaria. Though independent, these states had a shared culture and language, and there was a growing mood among their people for unification. But which princely state would determine the nature of the new Germany? Gerhard Luxenhofer, the castle curator, understands the message of Hohenschwangel better than most. Is a hint about various artistic dominance. Bavaria was really the cultural heart of Germany. So Maximilian saw it this way, the Bavarians saw it this way. Uh, they had their history over centuries. And that's why Maximilian wanted to show his history, the history of Bavaria, of his family. He wanted to have a kind of a picture book, a history picture book. He was very interested to teach his people here. So, so the, the paintings tell sto historical stories about Bavaria, about, about the family, about his great history as, yeah. as rulers in this, in this area. Also, there are myths and legends. After centuries, where all these myths were forgotten, yeah. and they, were, they were collecting them again. Well, that's the Brothers Grimm, of course, who are involved yeah. in this creation of yes. the Sinchera scheme. And, and the Brothers Grimm and some others were very involved. They were, they were uh, searching for the myths of the, the old Germans. Uh, they, were, they were collecting these sagas and fairy tales. So this was a renaissance of German identity. One room, more than any other, would captivate the young Ludwig. This is the hall of the Swan Knight, and it tells the story of Lohengrin. Now, according to legend, Lohengrin, a grail knight, left his family, shown in this painting here, and stepped into small craft pulled by a single white swan, and then was taken away to save a damsel in distress. For Ludwig's father, the greatest heroes of the past were the Knights of Schwangau, literally translating as the Knights of the Swan. The swan appears again and again throughout the castle, and as a symbol of the idyllic hero, was a creature that Ludwig came to identify with strongly. He began to imagine that when he grew up, he would be the Swan King. The Lohengrin character of legend made monarch. The scale and imagery of Hohenschwangau is extraordinary, but it would be nothing compared to the heights to which the adult Ludwig would go. On the 10th of March, 1864, Ludwig became King of Bavaria. He was crowned at the royal palace in the heart of the Bavarian capital, Munich. He was just 18 years old, a shy young man, and not greatly interested in affairs of state. He was much more interested in the things that happened in the magnificent building, just a stone's throw from the royal residence. It was a place where he could lose himself in the stories and legends he adored. <laughs> the 
Munich Theatre and Opera House was for Ludwig a spectacular place of magic and escapism. Here he saw that heroic architecture could be evoked through operatic stage sets. Artifice would be the means to conjure up the power of German myth and legend as the epic scale demanded. The man who would take opera to new romantic heights in the 19th century was Richard Wagner. And Ludwig had been following the great composer even as a boy. On the 2nd of February 1861, three years before he became king, Ludwig attended a performance here in the Munich State Theatre of Wagner's Lohengrin. Now at that point, Ludwig was 15 years old and familiar with Wagner's writing about art and politics. But his experience that night in this theatre transformed admiration into something akin to religious devotion. One of Ludwig's first actions on becoming king was to invite Wagner to dinner. Wagner was 50 years old. Ludwig was 18. It was an extraordinary relationship. The gauche boy king and the operatic revolutionary. But they shared a love of excess and a world built on a heroic scale. And of course, an obsession with Germanic legend. For Ludwig, Wagner's operas are magical experiences, revelations. They transported him into worlds of beauty, myth, legend and romance. Soon, he started to command his own private performances, so he could hear the music in solitude. But eventually not even that was enough. He built his own Wagnerian stage sets. Einstein, Ludwig's remarkable attempt to realize the operas of Richard Wagner were masonry and mortar. In a commanding position, high above a ravine, this was to be the castle of Lohengrin, the Swan Knight. And a powerful statement of Ludwig's position, a king with a mythological status part of the pantheon of strong Germanic kings of legend. It's an extraordinary Romanesque and Gothic vision of a medieval knight's castle. The image is taken straight from German legend. The impression is of a fairy tale castle perched on top of an impossible mountain. Neuschwanstein is a stunning feat of engineering. Work began in 1869 and continued for almost two decades, at times employing between two and three hundred workers per day. It drew artists, craftsmen and artisans from much of Europe. The result is pure architectural theatre. This courtyard is based on Wagner's instructions for a stage set for his opera Lohengrin. Ludwig took his architectural inspiration primarily and certainly for this castle from Wagner rather than from architectural precedent. And when he needs a detailed drawings, he turned not to an architect, but to a set designer. Christian Yank had worked with Wagner at the Court Theatre on an early performance of Lohengrin. 
From the start, Yank's drawings show an heroic vision. Ludwig's fantasy, Wagner's fiction, and a heavy helping of romantic gothic. Ludwig's mind would be the singer's hall that brought legend and reality together. A medieval-style feasting room in which Wagner's operas could be sung. And a monument to the knights and kings of Germanic myth. This would hardly be more theatrical. This is like a backdrop on the stage at one end of the singer's hall. Amazing, it shows the enchanted forest surrounding the hiding place of the Holy Grail. The legend of the Grail was one of Ludwig's greatest inspirations in the castle. It had everything. Chivalric knights, religious significance, and untold power. The singer's hall is Ludwig at his most heroic and optimistic. But in private, there are parts of the castle that don't quite fit this conventional Teutonic vision. This is Ludwig's bedroom, very ecclesiastical, richly monastic. In front of me, his bed, which is amazing, really. It's like a gothic shrine, a tremendously rich carved canopy, a shrine or two. Uh, amazing, really. As Ludwig lay there, he uh, was designed over by a, a portrait of the Virgin Mary. On the walls are scenes from the story that was uh, very much part of Germanic myth. The story, the legend of Tristan and Zelda. Uh, a strange story really for, for this bedroom because it speaks of forbidden earthly love brought on by enchantment. A story that ends in tragic death, but through death there is redemption. Ludwig never married, and his sexuality has long been the subject of speculation. Throughout his life, he formed close bonds with numerous young men, from actors to courtiers. It seems almost certain that Ludwig was homosexual. Seen in this light, the room begins to make sense. As a devout Catholic monarch, Ludwig's homosexuality fills him with remorse, shame, and guilt. And I suppose, therefore one can see these paintings as representing for him a cautionary tale. A tale that told him that earthly love was out of bounds. Also, I suppose, he could have suggested that through death, he would be redeemed. Outside the bedroom, Ludwig seems to regain his confidence. His throne room expresses Ludwig's desire to be an autocratic king, ruling by God's will rather than the constrained, constitutional monarch that he was. This really is the focus of the entire castle, not just the throne room, but a shrine to kingship, and a bold statement of Ludwig's belief that kings rule by divine right. 
It also reveals his view of himself as an, a king ruling by God's grace, but also as a mediator between the world and God. That explains the scheme of decoration of the room to degree. Here below me on the floor are images of plants, flowers, animals, the world we inhabit. Above is a celestial dome, stars, and a great sun, I suppose, the heavens, the sky, God, and the world of man. And between the two is a great chandelier in the form of a regal crown. Representing, of course, the king's role between the world and God, the mediator. Yet this elaborate imagery was not a public statement. Neither Ludwig's subjects nor visiting dignitaries were allowed in. This was an expression of visual beauty and of a kingly ideal for the eyes of Ludwig and God alone. So this seeming public statement was only for Ludwig's private satisfaction. Strange, but little here is as straightforward or obvious as it might seem. Above the throne room lies a structural reality behind the theatre set. This castle is all about appearances. Here, history is only Skin deep, clearly, Ludwig didn't care too much about authentic medieval construction because behind the veneer of Romanesque detail and stone is this utterly modern, utilitarian, almost industrial world because this in front of me is the dome above the throne room. Incredible. There's the central dome of the throne room and you see it's supported by, I suppose, wrought iron lattice. Uh, sort of uh, ribs, and they uh, hold up the dome itself, which appears to be made of some sort of concrete or, or, or lime uh, mixture entirely modern. So, an incredible world, isn't it? The low, ancient beauty up here, modern industrial construction. The relationship between engineering and artifice is an effective one. Likewise, the overall fantasy of Louis Schwanstein was not entirely disconnected from events outside its walls. In 1866, Ludwig and Bavaria had suffered a bruising humiliation. Ludwig, much against his will, had been obliged to pick sides when two Germanic states, Austria and Prussia, came to blows. Unfortunately, he backed the wrong horse. Feeling more sympathy for their southern neighbours and fellow Catholics, the Bavarians had sided with Austria. But the conflict, known as the Seven Weeks' War, ended in a decisive Prussian victory. Ludwig's image of himself had taken a blow. Both his kingdom and his position had been fundamentally weakened. Ludwig's retort to reality, a beacon for how things should be. It would set him on a course. Architecture would become his manifesto for a better future. It would be a journey that would take Ludwig to ever greater heights of visual beauty and excess.
music became increasingly reclusive as he spent more and more of his time, money and energy on architecture. If Louis Fernstein was a castle fit for a swan king, what he needed, he thought, was a country retreat, a royal villa, and he knew just the place to build it. Ludwig had inherited a small hunting lodge just 15 miles into the mountains from Neusch Fanstein. He now turned his attention to transforming it into a royal palace, a refuge deep in the secluded woods, and one that could scarcely be more dissimilar to Neusch Fanstein. This is Linderhof. After Neusch Fernstein, this uh, palatial villa comes as something of a surprise. It's utterly different in architectural style and in scale. Gone are the fairy tale towers and a mock medieval detailing. Instead for this, well, the mini palace, Ludwig preferred to go for the uh, baroque classical manner of 18th century France. For Ludwig, this change in style was deliberate. In the real world, he was a king constrained by his ministers and by the military might of his Prussian neighbour. But in his imagination, he was the very embodiment of the all-powerful monarch, a king ruling by divine right. One historical figure, more than any other, symbolized this ideal for Ludwig. Oh, the entrance vestibule, solid grandeur, lovely marble Doric columns, and, um, ah, well, now, there can be no doubt about who's the inspiration behind this creation, because here, confronting all who arrive, is a the Christian statue of the French king Louis XIV, the epitome of the absolute monarch. A lovely piece of work, and here, on the ceiling above, the great sunburst of the sun king, with, in the middle, uh, the, the one motto, Nec pluribus impar, none his equal. Of course, the motto of, uh, of the sun king Louis, but also the motto by which Ludwig would like to be known. As Prussia dominated the Germanic world, and Bavaria's power waned, Ludwig's architecture became the one place he could create the world as he thought it should be. A world that respected the power of absolute monarchy, the world of Louis the Fourteenth. What an astonishing room, an incredible evocation of the grandeur and opulence of early 18th century France. This is the king's bedroom, there is the king's bed, separated from the world of mere mortals by this balustrade. Raised as if on an altar is that divine bed of the incredible, sort of divine king, incredible sanctified territory. Here, you would think, would have resided in solitary grandeur. Almost every room in this building speaks of power and kingship through beauty. They do so on a surprisingly small scale. This is Ludwig's world in miniature, a private set of rooms decorated to mind-boggling intensity. This is the most visually dramatic room in the palace. 
Sliding here between these two rivers, I can see an endless vista of rooms stretching to infinity. It's incredible. Ludwig would come into this narrow room to read alone at night. It's strange this mirrored room offers a window into Ludwig's soul. Imagine him standing here looking into these mirrors, seeing himself in a vast and stately palace. But in fact, it's nothing but a tiny room or just a figment of his imagination. Each room in this mini palace is stuffed full of priceless works of art, several porcelain urns, and even several porcelain peacocks. Mice and candelabra and sconces. Grabmeyer crystal chandeliers. Under the patronage of Ludwig, there was a blossoming of the arts in Bavaria. Munich came second only to Paris and Vienna as a center of artistic excellence. And Ludwig was a man possessed. Every detail was agonized over. Every element personally overseen by the obsessive monarch inside and out. The gardens became Ludwig's playground, where he achieved glorious and instant gratification through the construction of buildings that were little more than stage sets. Inside this mound is Ludwig's response to the Venus Grotto in Wagner's opera Tannhauser. Now, I shall enter through this rocky crevice here in front of me, and uh, strangely I see the way it's blocked by a vast stone. With this clear door, it shall be heavy, I expect. Rather impressive. Oh, <laughs> no, it's a little plaster. <laughs> As with so much of Ludwig's world, all is pure artifice. The entire grotto is man-made, a framework of iron girders skillfully covered with canvas and plaster, and sculpted to give the impression of a natural grotto, complete with stalactites. This grotto is truly amazing, so much bigger than you would think from the outside, and like so many of Ludwig's creations, both eccentric and breathtaking. It is ultimate theatre what evocation. And here, look, incredible, here is the world of Wagner and Tannhauser. Here is the lake, and there, on the back wall, indeed, is a painted scene from the opera showing Venus in her grotto. There is the design. Here is the reality in three dimensions created by Ludwig for his pleasure and escape and fantasy lake here and the craft, the sort of shell craft boat from the opera. He would be rowed around the lake in that. You can imagine him sitting in it, fantasizing, escaping in this incredible world he's created, a world of pure imagination and artifice. The theatricality of the grotto was enhanced by the use of pioneering technology. Dynamos were installed to power lights with rotating coloured glass discs, which created a changing light show for the king. Music in 
celebrate stage design and new technology at every turn in the pursuit of the perfect illusion. Not far from the Venus Grotto is something perhaps even more surprising. This extraordinary site with all the great moments in architecture, the wonderfully incongruous juxtaposition of this gilded this alarming dome set against the craggy backdrop of the barbarian Alps. The Moorish Kiosk was built for the World Exhibition in Paris in 1867. Ludwig saw it and had to have it. He built the entire structure and had it rebuilt in the grounds at Lindahoff. A richly decorated interior that transported Ludwig from the Bavarian Alps to the exotic kingdoms of the Arab world. The focus of the kiosk is the peacock throne, a magnificent affair there we have the peacock presiding over the sofa on which Ludwig would have sat. He had the peacock made in Paris and Munich in 1877, made of metal. The feathers are enameled metal with polished stone. The peacock to him represented eternity, the continuation of this state of bliss. It really is a most bold statement of power or imagined power through beauty. These buildings in the garden are pure fantasy, escapism of the most visceral kind. They were places in which Ludwig could, for a while, retreat from the woes and horrors of the real world. As he said to a contemporary, Oh, it is essential to create such paradises, such poetical sanctuaries, where one can forget for a while the dreadful age in which we live. As the events of that dreadful age developed, such sanctuaries became increasingly important to the king. Prussia went to war with France. It was part of a strategy to unite the Germanic states around a common enemy. Ludwig had no option but to join the war on the Prussian side. But he was all too well aware of the cost. Defeat would be disastrous, but so would Prussian victory. For Ludwig, the situation was impossible. Victory would confirm Prussia as a dominant state in a united Germany, and also confirm Bavaria as little more than a vassal, and his king, Ludwig, as a puppet monarch. Puppet king he would be. With Prussian victory came an irresistible call for the creation of a German empire but with Prussia at its head. The dream of German unification would happen, but Ludwig would be sidelined. Obliged to sign away Bavarian sovereignty to Prussia in a document known as the Kaiser Brief. On the 18th of January, 1871, the Prussian king was crowned Kaiser or Emperor of Germany in the famous Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles in France. The Palace of Louis XIV became the birthplace of the new German Reich. It was a victory for German nationalism on a Wagnerian scale. 
the one that made Lethe and Bavaria subservient to the Prussian king. Ludwig's response, as ever, would be architectural, and this time more ambitious than ever before. The Prussian king had defiled the greatest palace of Ludwig's hero, Louis XIV. Now Ludwig would create that palace anew, on an island on Lake Kinsey, far from the intrusion and disappointment of real life. Heron Kinsey, Ludwig's very own palace of Versailles. riches of a Bourbon monarch, but, at least in part, with a secret annual stipend paid to Ludwig by the Prussian exchequer after signing the Kaiser brief, the very document that had officially stripped Ludwig of much of his regal power and status. Goodness, what, what grandeur, what opulence, and dare I say, what, uh, what sort of pretension, really, because this staircase is based on the ambassador staircase in Versailles, of course. Same scale, same sort of plan. Incredible decoration. Apparently, walls of marble, though I'm sure it's only a veneer. What's amazing about this, of course, is that um, has real power slipped from Ludwig's lip in the world. He created bigger and grander buildings, as if, of course, to compensate for the loss of the real thing. Ludwig's architecture had begun by taking inspiration from the stage. Now it had truly become a little more than a stage. It really is one of the oddest architectural experiences I've ever had. I've travelled to a remote island in southern Bavaria and find myself in Versailles in the world of Louis XIV. Incredible in detail, in scale, in spatial experience. It's Versailles, really. This is the king's state bedroom, but of course not the bedroom of Louis XIV, but of Ludwig II, the man obsessed by Louis. Louis represented to Ludwig the idea of absolute monarchy. This is his homage to Louis. Incredible theirs. Ludwig's bed, the balustrade. What amazing opulence. It's, 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 it's extraordinary. Um, what can one say? It's uh, extreme. Extreme in every way. He's living in the shadow in the world of Louis XIV. Louis is everywhere. He's present. You always feel it. And that's the thing, you know, Louis was a great model for Ludwig of the, the proper king, a king ruling by divine right, the absolute monarch. And indeed, one can see images of Louis there above each of the four doors are scenes from court life in Versailles, each featuring Louis going about um, his business, dispensing power, giving audiences, indeed exuding that sort of power, that real power, which Ludwig did not have. There's one key difference. Louis XIV's palace functioned, Ludwig's did not. This is the council chamber, but no historic council meetings took place here. No audiences, Ludwig wouldn't allow them. But, of course, the palace of absolute monarch had to have an audience chamber. And so, here it is. There is the throne on which Ludwig should have sat. Behind it, staring down, as if bestowing blessings, is a portrait of Louis XIV. But, of course, it's all very sad, because he's looking down onto a chair which was and remains perpetually empty. 
so wie sein Hund. But the focus of the palace is Ludwig's answer to the very grandest room of Versailles. The scene of the recent Prussian triumph, which had led to the eclipse of Ludwig's dreams and ambitions for Bavaria. This is officially the most striking room in the palace, or is usually, but as you can see, it's under repair. It's based on the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Indeed, in many ways, it's a very exact replica. This room must have had great meaning for Ludwig. The Hall of Mirrors at Versailles had been sullied because it had been used by the Prussians as a location in which to proclaim their king, the new emperor of United Germany. Ludwig's response was to build his own Hall of Mirrors, which at 98 meters is somewhat larger than the original. He was, of course, making a point. In this grand hall, Ludwig's pursuit of beauty reached a crescendo. It is an almost exact reproduction of the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. That Ludwig couldn't resist one or two ironical, theatrical flourishes, such as this image of fame blowing her trumpet, a tumbling from the heights. In the dining room, the table is today encased in a protective glass box. It's not for the sake of the table, so much as what sits on it. Look, upon the table is well, a bunch of flowers, but they're not flowers. In the usual sense, they're made of porcelain, mice and porcelain, absolutely fantastic, sitting in mice and porcelain urn. Absolutely delicate, lifelike, beautiful, almost see the dew upon the petals, incredible stuff. But what's more amazing still, is what hangs above the table, look at that, the largest Meissen porcelain chandelier ever made, 108 candles on it, a thing of utter beauty, look at the colours, the way it glistens, it's a bunch of flowers, and I see it bursting on the stems of the, of, of the object. Absolutely amazing. Now, Ludwig was a jealous monarch. Jealous when it came to beauty, to things he loved. When this was made, he ordered that the world should be smashed, so no such chandelier could ever be made again. This remains unique. Here, the dining table is small, just seats four people really. So clearly, the king wanted to be left alone to dine in a reflective solitude, perhaps joined only by characters from his imagination. Also, the wishing table, as it's called, descends into the floor, sort of pulleys, so it can be laid, pulled up. The king can sit there dining and not be disturbed by servants coming and going. As with so much of Ludwig's world, this is a brilliant conjuring trick. Downstairs, Ludwig employed technology and the lessons of theatre set design to safeguard his solitude. This is the mechanism that operates on the machine table. Up there is the table, that wonderful porcelain Rococo dining room. Below here is a utterly ruthless piece of uh, late 19th century high-tech engineering and um, wonderful sort of lattice construction, wrought on and leading steel, and of course this great wheel is a winch, one which pushes round or a counterweight to the ratchet over here, and one would simply lower the table, down it will come, 
into the space here, and I suppose, if, on, if possible, I will put on the next course, and um, I thought here again. So, typical of Ludwig, this contrast of worlds, all the beauty, history, solitude, and down here, modern engineering, and I say a scurry of staff, active here, invisible to the king above. Ludwig retreated further in his own fancy world, he began to see himself not as a sun king in Louis XIV's image, but as the moon king, a dark reflection of his hero. Veronica Entlicker is the curator at Henry Kimsey and an authority on both the palace and its creator. Ludwig inverts aspects of Louis the Sun King because Ludwig sees himself as, as the Moon King, doesn't he? Yeah, Ludwig hat sich tatsächlich selbst als Mondkönig bezeichnet, und zwar deshalb, weil er ja im Endeffekt, je älter er wurde, desto mehr hat er sein komplettes Leben auf die Nacht oder auf die Dunkelheit verlagert. Es gibt ja auch ähm, Zeichnungen, ähm, und Gemälde, wo er bei Kutschfahrten oder bei Schlittenfahrten beim Mondlicht ähm, abgebildet ist. Of course, Ludwig is obsessed with beauty in architecture, in art. But he himself becomes his view anyway less beautiful. So this must be a big issue for him, a challenge. Ähm, seine körperliche Konstitution und auch seine psychische Konstitution hat ihn sehr stark beeinflusst. Ähm, dadurch, dass er im Laufe der letzten Jahre immer, ähm, ja, unförmiger geworden ist ähm, und auch keine Zähne mehr hatte, ähm, ist er seinen eigenen ästhetischen Ansprüchen nicht mehr gerecht geworden und das war auch ein Grund, warum er sich immer mehr aus der Öffentlichkeit zurückgezogen hat. Ähm, das heißt, Ludwig II. könnte man heute sagen, hatte eine Sozialphobie, ähm, er war aber sicherlich nicht geisteskrank. Also ähm, da würde man ihm nicht gerecht werden, wenn man ihn als geisteskrank bezeichnen würde. Ludwig only stayed at this palace once. Despite his grand plans, events overtook him, and the palace remains unfinished. The result is rather spooky. Beautifully ornate rooms lead into unfinished shells. Walking between these spaces is like walking off stage into the wings of a theatre. This is the uh, companion staircase, the one I walked up earlier. That, of course, clad in marble, a thing of great beauty expressing imperial power. This, a hollow sham, really, a grim reflection of reality. This is all so symbolic. Ludwig created this palace to express kingship, but he was, in fact, a king who'd lost his kingdom. And the unfinished state of his staircase captures the absolute moment when the dream came to an end. Ludwig's increasingly eccentric behavior had not gone unnoticed by his ministers. He spent months at a time away from Munich. He lived by night. And had little or no interest in public appearances or matters of state. More importantly, he'd run up enormous debts. The cost of his building schemes had bankrupted Ludwig, but he refused to curb his expenditure. By 1885, the king was more than 14 million marks in debt, three and a half billion euros in today's money. The cabinet, faced with a king who seemed to have few interests beyond his building projects and running up debts, decided to act. He gathered facts and opinions from Ludwig's staff and then consulted a team of psychiatrists. Now these psychiatrists, without even interviewing Ludwig, concluded that His Majesty is in a far advanced state of insanity. In 
It was always ministers needed to topple the monarch. Just after midnight on the 12th of June 1886, a government commission placed the king in custody. Ludwig's uncle was declared Prince Regent. Ludwig was transferred to a castle on the shores of Lake Starnberg near Munich and placed under house arrest. King had lost his kingdom, and perhaps more importantly, his beloved palaces. He was, according to accounts, bereft at the thought of the future. The following day, Ludwig went for a walk with his psychiatrist, Dr. Gruden, along the banks of the nearby lake. Neither man returned. After hours of searching, the bodies of Ludwig and Dr. Gruden were found floating in shallow water on the edge of the lake. Both had been dead for several hours. The body of Ludwig showed no signs of obvious injury, but the body of the doctor showed evidence of a violent struggle. The King's final moments have been the subject of debate and speculation ever since. Did Ludwig attempt suicide, killing his psychiatrist when he tried to intervene? Was it a dreadful accident? Or was the King murdered? And if so, why? And by whom? The truth is that Ludwig's last hours remain a mystery. The final mystery of the man who had declared, I want to remain an eternal enigma to myself and to others. He had his wish. Today, the site of his death is marked by this simple cross standing in the lake. This site remains a place of pilgrimage for Ludwig's admirers. They gather here every year on the anniversary of his death to mourn the lost king of Bavaria. Bigger places of pilgrimage are the palaces themselves. All were open to the public within six weeks of the king's death. They've paid for themselves many times over. Today, Neuschwanstein, the most famous of the palaces, receives some 6,000 visitors a day in the summer months and has received more than 50 million visitors since it was opened to the public on the 1st of August 1886. King Ludwig himself has become a symbol of German pride. More so today than ever he was in his lifetime. For many, he represents the heart of Bavaria and the soul of Germany. I'm going to hear from a young person um, about, about King Ludwig. What, 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 what do you think? What, what do people now think of this like, rather tragic king? He was kind of special, different, because you know, Bavaria is very, yeah, I would say conservative. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't for his time. Yeah, I think he was a very modern man in his thinking. And that's because he was an outsider then. So as a consequence, because people thought, oh God, what is, what is he doing? And he's spending so much money to some art or on architecture. But I think people love him today. They love him for that. For most people, the story of Ludwig ends at Lake Starnberg and the Wooden Cross, but for me, there's a more fitting memorial to this visionary and eccentric king. This is the Chapel of Grace in the small town of Alt some 60 miles from Munich. 
one of the most visited shrines in the whole of Germany. It is home to the much venerated Black Madonna, a 14th century icon of profound importance in Catholic Bavaria. But it is also a shrine to Ludwig. This beautifully crafted silver gold urn was made in 1886 by a jeweller that Ludwig used to decorate his palaces. Outside is Ludwig's cipher, two owls inclined. Inside is Ludwig's heart. This is entirely in keeping with barbarian tradition because left to inside and above are the hearts of other barbarian monarchs. It seems to me that it's completely fitting that a heart that beat for beauty, the heart of a king that lived for art and architecture, should reside for eternity in an object so beguiling, in a building so beautiful. Next, this evening on BBC4, listen out for the clang, clang, clang as Time Shift relives the golden age of the trolley car.